In this video, I'm going to be upgrading the system memory on this mid-2009 Apple MacBook Air. Now, the reason I'm doing this, and the main reason that this is quite a special upgrade in the case of this machine, is because Apple never offered this machine in any other memory configurations other than what you see here, with 2 gigabytes of system memory. Now, while that was probably good at the time this came out, and around early to or late 2008 early, or mid-2009, um, nowadays 2 gigs of RAM is barely usable uh, for any modern software or operating systems. So with that said, upgrading the RAM in this machine is going to drastically improve its performance and allow you to more easily run more modern software. Now, since this machine never actually had any other memory configurations other than two gigabytes, there is no provision on the system to specify other SPD information via straps or what have you on the motherboard. Now, I intend to get around this by simply editing the SPD info in the system BIOS. Now, of course, I will get to that later, um, but the basis of that are going to be these two SODEMs right here. So as you can see, these are Micron 2 gigabyte SODEMs. Um, they are, of course, PC3 8500S, which is 1066 megahertz DDR3 memory, um, which, of course, is what this machine needs. Um, so, but the reason I got specifically two 2 gigabyte modules is because if we take a look at the memory section of System Profiler here, you can see that the system, by default, emulates two banks or two modules of one gigabyte in size. So you can see down there the information. If I go ahead and click there, you can see that there are two one gigabyte virtual modules, I guess you could say, um, installed in this machine. Now, since there are two modules, of course I had to get two two gigabyte modules so I could program the correct SPD info in this machine, which I can simply dump off of these SODIMs from their SPD EEPROM, which is located right there. Um, but of course, we will get into that a little bit later in this video. Uh, for right now, though, we need to begin by upgrading the physical chips on the logic board. That's step one, of course. Now, in order to do that, I am going to be using the chips from these memory modules. Um, when I got them, I did ensure that they were um, the correct pinout and the correct specification um, to go on this board. Um, and of course, it'll match perfectly with the SPD info on them, so um, I see no reason why this shouldn't work. Now, with that said, the first thing we need to do before we do anything with this board is we need to desolder all eight chips on both of these modules, so there's 16 chips in total, and then reball each one of them to prepare them to be installed on the MacBook Air logic board. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pause the video, get the camera and the tripod, and then we'll begin the process of desoldering the memory mo memory chips from these SODEM modules. All right, so you can see here that I've gotten the SODEM module ready to be worked on. So the first thing we need to do is turn on the board for heater and get it warming up here. And then we will simply use the hot air um, to remove each of these chips here. Now, of course, uh, the first thing we need to do is just remove this sticker right here. So once it gets a little bit of heat into it, it should come off very easily. Okay, that was very easy right there. So now once that gets fully up to temperature, we can begin the process of removing all of the original chips. All right, so now that the module has gotten up to temperature, we're gonna go ahead and start by applying some flux to each chip. Now, of course, these are only on the top side uh, that we're going to be working on right now, but there are four more on the bottom we'll have to do after these. And, of course, we have two modules to do. All right, so now that flux has been applied, we'll just go ahead and start heating. All 
right, so now that that side's done, we're just gonna go ahead and let the uh, board cool down, flip it over, and get the floor off the other side of the uh, module. Alright, so as you can see, we got all 16 chips removed. Um, you can see them all uh, right here on the uh, board for unit here. So now all we need to do is just get these all laid out and prepare to uh, clean them off and get them ready to be reballed. So I'm going to go ahead and get all these laid out on a platform and we'll go ahead and start cleaning up the residual solder. All right, so since these are all mostly stuck down with flux, um, I'm just gonna do it on here, and if it ends up not working, I'll tape them down to something else. Um, but we're just gonna go through all of these modules and just remove all of the residual solder. Alright, so now that the modules are mostly clean, we'll just go back over them with some solder wick to remove everything else. Alright, so as you can see here, all of the residual solder has been removed from every chip. So now we can go ahead and begin the process of cleaning them and then applying new solder balls to them. So I'm going to get all these cleaned up with some rubbing alcohol and paper towels, and then we'll be ready to uh, begin the process of reballing these chips. Alright, so as you can see here, I've gotten the uh, chips in the jig here. Now, I'm lucky I had this jig that has uh, the provisions to reball four at once. Um, that's definitely going to make it a lot faster uh, than reballing one at a time. However, the issue I had with this is the little under stencil that holds like the chip in exactly the correct position. Um, I didn't have one of those of the correct size. They, uh, I'll show you what they look like. They look like this. And then if this goes underneath the stencil, you stick the chip in each of these holes and then it keeps it aligned against the sides of it here. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, I couldn't find one that was the exact size for these, these chips. So I found one that was as close as I could get and there's a little movement up and down, but as long as they're aligned mostly in the center, like they are now, it'll be just fine. So it's a little bit of extra time to get those aligned every time. Um, but it should work just fine. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get the hot air warming up here, and then we'll begin the process of reballing these chips. Now I'm using 0.45 millimeter balls, as you can see it says right here, or you may be able to see, um, but that is the correct size ball for this specific stencil. So I'm going to be using those, and 
Then we'll just go ahead and heat them up and get them all in their respective holes. I found that using your finger to do this is actually pretty effective, surprisingly. Now, of course, there always are a few that don't go in their holes, so you have to use some tweezers and manually place them in. Alright, and then once this jig luckily has a little thing where you can kind of shake the balls back into the thing, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So that way you don't waste all of them that you don't use. And then, now that all of the balls are in their respective holes, we can go ahead and begin heating and melt them onto their pads. Um, so this time, usually I apply flux to the chips beforehand. This time I did not, just because it's going to be a huge pain to do that with all of these. Um, so I'm going to see if this works. I'm not 100% sure it will. Um, I'm going to just get it hot and then apply like a tiny bit of flux to each one and then heat it once again and that should hopefully work. So we'll go ahead and start getting it hot right now. Okay, now it's nice and warm, so I'm gonna go ahead and get some flux. And my main worry here is that the flux is gonna try to pull some of the balls out of the holes, but hopefully. They've at least somewhat stuck to their pads and it looks like it's working. Okay, I did lose one there. You can see it popped out there, so I'm gonna have to put that back in. Um, but other than that, it looks pretty good. So let's go ahead and uh, just get a ball out here and put that back. There we go. And let's heat once again. So now they're looking much nicer with that flux helping them seat properly. Okay, and that all looks good. So now we just have to wait for it to cool down just a little bit, remove the stencil, and then I'll repeat that process for the rest of these chips. So I'll do four at a time, so that would be just three more times. So not too bad. Um, so now that the uh, stencil has cooled down just enough, we're gonna take it off and remove it. Alright, and now that the chips are off, we want to go ahead and just heat them one more time to fully seed all the balls.
All right, and those are looking really good. So like I said, we're just gonna go ahead and repeat the process for the rest of the chips, and then we'll be able to solder them onto the board. Of course, we do have to clean everything off each time we do this, which is kind of time consuming, but. Right. So as you can see here, all the chips have been reballed successfully. Um, and go ahead and take a close look at one here. You can see that all the balls are of a uniform height, just as they should be, and they look absolutely perfect. So with that, we are now ready to begin the process of replacing the RAM chips on the MacBook Air motherboard. So as you can see, the motherboard is right here. Um, like I said, there are 16 chips on this. There are eight chips on this side and then eight more on the other side of the board. Um, so what we're gonna go ahead and do now is just take this board out, put it on the board preheater, and from there we can begin the process of desoldering all of these memory chips. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the board all ready on the board preheater here. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is just see if I can remove um, this little piece of tape up here, this black piece of tape, as you can see right here. Um, if it doesn't come off easily, I'll just leave it, but I think it will. Okay, it came right off, so now that won't melt uh, while we're heating. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and just get the hot air ready here. And from there, we'll go ahead and just remove all of these chips right here. So while that's warming up, I'm just going to go ahead and start applying flux to each chip. I guess I should also try to remove this piece of tape as well. Over there. All right, and with that ready, we'll go ahead and just start heating the chips and then remove them from the board.
All right, so now that all of the top chips are removed, the next thing we need to do is just go over them with the soldering iron and remove all of the residual solder. Alright, so there's the top completely clean, so we're going to go ahead and just wipe that uh, burnt flux off with some rubbing alcohol and a paper towel, and then we'll flip it over and do the same with the back side of the board. Alright, so now with the board flipped over, we just have to do the same thing once again on this side. All right, now with all that taken care of, we're ready to begin soldering our new chips onto the board. Now in order to do that, we're first gonna just go by and apply some fresh flux to each pad and then uh, wipe the excess off with a paper towel. Okay, so that's looking really good there. So now we'll just go ahead and take eight of our newly reballed chips and place them onto the board. Of course, we want to align pin one with pin one on the silk screen there. And right now we're just getting them into their general positions and then we'll um, align them with tweezers once we're ready to solder them on. All right, all of the uh, chips look to be perfectly aligned onto the board now. Um, so now what we're gonna go ahead and do is just turn the hot air back on and solder them all on. Alright, all those look to be soldered on alright. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I uh, lost a little capacitor right there. I know where it is, but uh, I'll just have to solder that on once I'm done before testing it. But uh, other than that, it's all good. So now we'll just go ahead and flip it over and solder the chips onto the other side. All right, so as before, we're just gonna go ahead and apply flux to each of the pads here.
And then from there, like before, we'll just wipe away the excess. And then align and solder the chips. Alright, all the chips seem to be pretty well aligned, so now we'll just go ahead and solder them on. Alright, all the chips seem to be soldered on just fine, so now we'll just go ahead and turn everything off and let the board cool down. Alrighty, so as you can see here, the RAM chips were all soldered on successfully. Um, so if we go ahead and take a look, you can see that all of the chips are completely uniform on the board. Um, and maybe we can go ahead and take a look at those solder balls under there, if I can get it in the right light here. Yeah, they are pretty close to the board, but um, you want to just check and make sure all of the solder balls are completely uniform and flattened down, um, and all the chips should have the exact same gap uh, to the board as well. So those all look good. Um, I did fix uh, that capacitor I mentioned earlier off camera, and that's all looking good. So now what I'm gonna go ahead and do is put the cooler back on, and we'll go ahead and test the board. Now keep in mind, I have not modified any of the SPD info on here yet. So in theory, um, it should just boot up, but only detect two gigabytes of memory installed. Now there's a chance it might give me the three beep RAM error code, um, but I'm not thinking that's going to happen, but um, hopefully it just boots up and works so that way we can test and make sure uh, all the RAM is working properly, and then after that we can go ahead and edit the SPD information. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and install the CPU cooler, and we'll go ahead and test the board. Alrighty, so as you can see here, I've gotten the board all plugged in, we've got the MagSafe connected, so let's go ahead and power the machine on and see what happens. All right, so as I suspected, we're getting the uh, three beat uh, RAM error code right now. Um, so we will have to modify the SPD info um, in order for the machine to boot. So I'm gonna go ahead and unplug that so it stops beeping. And uh, I'll go ahead and take the board back out. We'll desolder the SPI ROM. And then from there, we can dump it and modify it as necessary. So I'll go ahead and get the board back out and we'll start desoldering the SPI ROM. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the board ready to remove the SPI ROM, uh, which is located right here. So we're gonna go ahead and just get the board warming up here, and we'll go ahead and desolder it. Alright, so as you can see, I've gone ahead and gotten the SPI ROM off the board. It's right here, as you can see. So now I'll just go ahead and just clean this up and put it into my adapter so we can use it in my EEPROM programmer. Alright, so for my EEPROM programmer here, I have this little QFN adapter. Um, so you can go ahead and just open the little lid on this, and then you can just insert a chip such as this. So let me get pin 1 in the correct orientation here ahead and put it in. It goes in like that. And then all you have to do is close up the lid and it's ready to be used. So I'll go ahead and get this in the EEPROM programmer and show you what to do from there. Alrighty, so as you can see, I've gotten the EEPROM in my EEPROM programmer here in its little adapter. Um, so now we'll go ahead and dump it. So the first thing we need to do is select the IC. So we'll just go ahead and select 25 flash detect since it is a 25 series SPI ROM. So as you can see, it detected it there. 
And our particular one is a 3205D. Go ahead and select that. And we'll just select read. Alrighty, and as you can see, the system ROM was read successfully. And now we'll just go ahead and save that to a bin file. So we'll just name that um, MBA2, comma one original. So that way we can keep that saved. So we can go ahead and close that. And from here, we can go ahead and open that in a hex editor. So I'm going to be using HXD on this machine. Go ahead and open that from here. Let's see, NBA2, comma one original. So there is our SPI ROM dump. So now what we need to do is locate the SPD section of this ROM. So in order to do that, um, we have this little guide right here for the SPD information or the SPD table for DDR3 memory. And it is different between DDR2 and DDR3. Um, but we'll go down here and see what all the information is. So we can basically be guaranteed that this is going to be 92. Uh, we have a few versions here to choose from. 0B, and we know it's a SODIMM, so 03. So we can, that's enough bytes that we can just search for those in the dump and easily locate our SPD information. So we'll go ahead and get that out here. We'll do find hex values. 9.2 and as you can see I've already done this before so we'll just go ahead and do that since I'm pretty sure that's correct from what I remember um, so that means it's going to be a revision 1.0 SPD which this is all this doesn't really matter and then of course we have 0B in there and 03 so you can see that uh, right there 0B03 so we'll go ahead and search for that and as you can see there is the SPD data right there. So if we go and just take a quick gander at this, you can see that the that there are a few different entries for SPD information. So you can see that these two top ones are exactly the same. Um, this one and this one are basically identical. I've already dumped these and analyzed it uh, previously, so I do know that's, that's, that that's the case. And this part number corresponds to micron memory. So that's this is the SPD information it would be using if there were micron memory installed by default. But in our case, we had Hynix memory installed by default. So we can see that once again, there are two entries here for Hynix memory. You can see the Hynix part number here for each one. Now, from what I understand, uh, each one of these entries, since they're identical, is each of those two emulated uh, memory modules, as we saw in the system when it was uh, when it had the original memory installed. So what we're going to go ahead and do here is just take this information and overwrite it with the information from the SPD info of the SODIMM that we dumped earlier. Now I already did dump that off camera um, because it's basically. I did it actually in the OS. You can actually use I squared C tool in Linux to dump the SPD information from your um, SODEM modules or any memory module for that matter. So you can see we've got the information here for Hynix. Um, you can see the length of that is uh, 1000 or 100 hex, which is 256 bytes, which is the correct length for SPD information. So now we're gonna go ahead and just open another file and that is the dump I made earlier. So let me go ahead and select that here. Let's see, it should be micron. Here it is, micron two gigabyte SODIMM. So as you can see, there is the SPD information for that SODIMM. So all we're gonna do is just simply take this and we're gonna leave out this FF section because that's just padding, which we don't need. Um, just copy that and go over to our dump here and we're going to replace both sets of Hynix SPD information with the SPD information we extracted from the SODIMM. So in order to do that, since we already copied it, we're just going to do paste write and you can see that will simply overwrite all that information with the information we extracted from the SODIMM. So we'll do that one more time 
for this section of data down here. Paste right. As you can see, that data was overwritten. And as you can see, there are two more SPD definitions down here, uh, but no manufacturing info is defined, or at least not the part number, which is this ASCII string right here. Um, so with that, I think that's all the modification we need to do to this SPI ROM. So we're going to go ahead and save this as, I'm going to save it as modded SPD. Go ahead and save that there. We'll go back over to the EEPROM programming tool here. Our IC, as you can see, is already selected. Now we'll go ahead and load that modified SPI ROM dump. So we've got MBA 2,1 modded SPD. We'll load that up here and we'll simply program it. All right, so as you can see, the programming was successful. So now we'll just go ahead and get the SPI ROM soldered back on the MacBook Air logic board. All right, so we're now ready to begin soldering the SPI ROM back onto the board. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is just wick all these pads here and tin them with leaded solder, which will make uh, soldering a whole lot more easy, or a whole lot easier, rather. So let's go ahead and get that ready to go here. So the first thing I'm going to do is just apply some solder. And I took a little resistor with me unfortunately. Right, first thing I'm going to do is get that resistor right. resistor back on there, and now we can just solder on our SPI ROM. Okay, our SPI ROM is now soldered back on, so let's just let the board cool down and we'll give it a test. Alrighty, so after a lot of experimentation, I found that my previous instructions on how to actually perform this modification uh, were completely wrong. So I'm going to go ahead and joke through it again and show you exactly what the correct method is to change that SPD info in the system's SPD or SPI ROM. So first thing we need to do is get a copy of UEFI tool. Um, you need to make sure it's the normal version, not the NE or the new engine version. It has to be the old style version, I guess, with the old engine. Um, so in this case, the latest version is 0.28 of that. So now we want to open the image file. And here you're just going to, so going to select the dump of your SPI ROM that you made earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and select my MBA to come on original. So we've got that right there. And then of course, the next thing we need to do, like we did before, is locate the SPD information. So in order to do that, I'm just going to copy these bytes because I know that it starts with this, as I showed you earlier from that table. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just search for those bytes. And you can see it appears in quite a few different areas right here. So what we're going to do is first figure out each section that those bytes appear in. So you can see it appears here, 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 all in the same. But this next one is actually in a different section, as you can see right there. So you can see that one's in one section, that one's in a different section, and there's a bunch more in that same second section, which I never noticed before. Um, so you do need to uh, take that into account. And then to add on to that, there's even a third section where some SPD info is stored. Um, we'll have to do that, we'll have to modify it in there as well. So we'll go ahead and first find the first offset here, or the first section. 
So once you've figured out that section, in, case, in this case it's a TE image, we're just going to right click on that and select Extract Body. So you're going to save that to wherever you want, and I'll just save it as TE image dot bin. And now that's saved. Now you're going to want to find that second TE image right here and then extract that body as well. So we'll name that TE image 2 dot bin. And now that that's saved, the last one we need to do is this section right here, this PE32 image, so we'll just extract body, PE32.bin, and now we've gotten all three of those extracted. So now you're going to want to go ahead and head into your hex editor and open each one of those that we just saved right there. So first thing I need to do is locate my TE image right there. And I think these are identical, but I extracted them individually just to be safe. And you should do the same if you're attempting this. So we'll open both T images, and then we'll open the PE32 image. Just like so. So now what we need to do is head on over to the dump of the SPD EEPROM from the SODIM module, and only select these bytes right here. So only select this much, these first bytes. This is all you actually need. All this tells it the memory information, so the memory chip size, the layout, and all that stuff. So all you need is this. So I'll just go ahead and copy that right here. So go into your first T image, find those bytes to find the SPD info in it. So we can see it right here. Now what you're going to want to do is just simply replace each one with that data that we got from the SPD EEPROM of the SODIM module. So we'll start with this one right here, just paste right, and as you can see, it will just, and I mistook there, you only want to select up to this 3C3C01 section, not, not that much. So you're just going to select all this, just to there. So it should be a selection size of 1D in hex, so just select that. And once again, we'll just go ahead and paste that in right here. And now that looks correct. You can see it only overwrote the bytes that were necessary. So we'll just do that for each section here. Okay, and now all those are set. So now we need to say, go ahead and save that. Go over here to the second TE image, and we can just scroll down, there's not much data in it, and find those SPD dumps, or those SPD entries right here. And once again, just do the same thing, just paste right on each one. And the only reason we're doing this on every single one is I couldn't really figure out exactly which SPD tables the machine was actually using. Um, so I figure if you just replace all of them, you're guaranteed to have it use at least one of them. So that's why I'm doing this. It's most likely just the Hynix ones in TE image and TE image 2 because that's what the board originally came with. But like I said, I'm just going to replace all of them just because there's really no reason not to. I'm never going to change those resistor straps on the motherboard, so it doesn't really matter. So once again, we'll uh, just replace all of these. Let's find it here. And I'm having trouble finding it. Oh, here we go, 9-2. And there's only two in this section. Okay, and now all those are done. Save them. Go back into UEFI tool. Find the first TE image section, right click, select um, replace body. Now you're going to want to just select the TE image um, dump that you uh, modified just now with the hex editor. So you can see I'm going to select TE image.bin. You can see it'll say remove and rebase. And the reason we have to use UEFI tool is there are actually some checksums in the SPI ROM that have to be updated um, in order for it to actually post. So that's why that's happening. So now we'll go ahead and find our second TE image section 
And once again, replace body. T image two dot bin. Once again, it says the same thing. And that last PE32 section, we'll do replace body, find PE32, right there, and it will remove and replace it for us. So now you want to select File, Save Image File, and once again, we'll just name it MBA2,1. SPD and you can just say yes on open reconstructed file and that's it it's all done so now we can go ahead into the programmer application load that dump that we just edited so we'll find it MBA 2 comma 1 modded SPD go ahead and load that into this hex editor here or the uh, the programming tool and then you'll just flash that onto your SPI ROM. Now, of course, I've already done this because I've been uh, doing quite a few tests to figure this out, um, but I have indeed figured it out and it does indeed work. So now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put the machine together for you and show you that it works as intended. All right, so as you can see here, we've gotten the machine all plugged in and ready to go. So let's go ahead and power it on and let it boot into Mac OS. As you can see, it chimed and posted, no problem at all. All right, and as you can see, we have booted into Mac OS. So let's go ahead and check about this Mac. And there it is, four gigabytes of 1066 megahertz DDR3 is installed. Let's go ahead and check here. You can see it is, of course, the same machine with uh, no serial number uh, flashed on this board, so I will have to take care of that later. Uh, but what that does mean is that this SPI ROM dump that I have is not personalized at all. So I can actually distribute this and uh, you can flash it on your machine without modifying it yourself if you don't want to, if you decide to do this upgrade. Um, so I will put a link to that and the SPD dump from that two gigabyte uh, memory module, that SODEM that I've been using uh, to as my reference to do this and where I got the chips from. So I will put a link to both of those files in the description if you ever intend to try this yourself. So let's go ahead and go into system report. We'll check out the memory section of system profiler here. So yep, as you can see, it detects two two gigabyte modules installed. So you can see that all that info is exactly the same, of course, because we only edited the main definitions that I showed you earlier. So the manufacturing info and all this stuff is not going to be changed. So that has been the successful upgrade of this mid-2009 Apple MacBook Air from two gigabytes to four gigabytes of system memory, which of course is a configuration that was never offered by Apple from the factory. Now, one last note before I finish this video, I am gonna do this upgrade again, but instead of doing four gigs of memory, I'm gonna do eight gigabytes of system memory. So that will be an even better system. So I'm really excited for that. Um, I'm not gonna make a full video on that, but I will probably make at least a brief video showing that it works. Um, I fully intend it to because of course, I can edit the SPD info to whatever I want. So with that, that has been the successful system memory upgrade of this mid-2009 Apple MacBook Air. Hope you enjoyed this video.